Okay, welcome back everybody. So just a couple announcements. Midterm this Wednesday in class. So we're gonna do a 50 minute midterm. So I'm gonna be here early. You should be here a couple minutes early so you can take advantage of the full 50 minutes. Um, I'm gonna ask about five questions. So on Monday, we will do a yes, no, maybe session. I'll probably say a few things about assignments that are upcoming for about 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll go into yes, no, maybe, and you can ask me what's on the exam. And I'll tell you, and we'll have a conversation about it. Um, I'll try not to just say maybe, 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 maybe. So we'll try to make it useful. So bring questions if anything is giving you anxiety. Um, we can try to alleviate that by telling you you've got to study it. Okay? And what sort of details we're looking for. Okay. Um, so also, just in terms of the way I use the word this, I mean this coming is the way that I use it, and next is the one after this one. So I use this maybe a little different than the way you use it. So this coming Wednesday, next Friday, because today's already Friday, so this Friday is today. That's the way I use the words. I know that it's ambiguous. Um, I'll also point out, I said a lot about the beta distribution. And so you might be thinking about this as a posterior distribution or something like this. This would be true for a prior as well, or any beta. But a Bayesian might update the parameters, and for alpha till, they would have alpha, the hyperparameter, plus some of the XIs. And for beta till, you'd have the number of failures plus beta, your hyperparameter. Um, if you do a transformation of this, this is a one to one transformation because P lives between zero and one. Uh, that distribution is called a beta prime. And so I'm going to be asking you to study, um, a, do a simulation study on the odds ratio of something. So if a Bayesian was studying the odds ratio, they would base it maybe off of this distribution if they're using a conjugate prior. Um, there's some things you have to think about, about the hyperparameterization and all of that. There's things you can do to make your life easy, but bias the answers really badly. So you can solve numerical issues doing that, but are those good answers? Uh, I do have an assignment up and coming for you. So it's called Delta Boot in Bayes. And you can have a look at that. I gave you the PDF on this. What I'm going to ask you to do is simulate data from the Bernoulli or binomial model. I don't care what you think about. There will be an N in there. So, and basically, you're going to compare these three methods. Delta method, Bayes, and Boot. So we kind of studied what that would look like for Delta method. You can imagine doing it for Bootstrap. So all you do is you bootstrap your data and compute the odds ratio. And do it over and over and over again. So it's a computational approach. Where Delta method, while there might be some computation involved, it's really an asymptotic approach. So in Bayes, is an entirely different thing altogether. And so there's three different ways you can maybe address this question. And so we're going to start doing some comparison. So problem one, I'll, speak, I'll say more about this on Monday for about 10 minutes before we do yes, no, maybe. But problem one is going to be sample a bunch of data. So make n relatively large. I think I give you some settings for it. So I think I say make n a thousand and sample x size from a Bernoulli 0.5 whole bunch of times. Um, compute g of x bar. So g of x bar is going to be your transformation of x bar. It's going to be x bar over 1 minus x bar. Be your transform. And then apply this distribution. Like apply that stuff to this distribution right here. Keep in mind where I have this square root of n, I did it in the limiting way. So if you're actually going to use this in practice, you bring the n over here and divide by the n. And then any estimates you'd have, anything for p, you'd probably estimate using x bar if you're going to use this as an inferential tool. So you'll plug everything in. You'll, to this distribution, you can draw that density function and just plot it. And then you can compute a simulation study and repeat it some number of times and draw the corresponding histogram. What I want you to do is normalize that histogram so the area under it is 1. If you just type in hist, it won't do that. So you've got to go to Crayon or MATLAB and find some normalized histogram package, probably. Or you can write whatever. 
Um, but basically, normalize that histogram from the 5,000 repeated um, things where you're actually going back out into the population and you're sampling over and over again. And um, compare that histogram to this density, and they'll look really good. So P is around 0.5. So it's pretty well behaved. It's not close to the boundaries, and N is big. So this result should look good. Um, later on, we're going to have you kind of change everything and change the sample sizes. So you can imagine as the sample size gets smaller and smaller, this approximation looks worse and worse. Um, and so you'll demonstrate that. The remainder pro of the problems, problem two, problem this is problem two, problem two, so that's problem two, problem three, and problem four. I can't count, but you guys know how to count. So I do this all the time for some reason. Um, but anyway, there's three extra problems. One of them says, do the bootstrap. And so I give you some slightly different notation in all of the lines of this, so you can get used to different notations in the way that people say the exact same thing. So it basically says, compute the bootstrap and compute these two estimators. You know, E hat and B hat, what's um, E hat for your thing? It's going to be P hat over 1 minus P hat. What's P hat is X bar? I could have said it that way. Um, and then compute your variance, your approximate variance, this bootstrap thing. So here I do have the end tucked in here in disguise because I have variance of X bar, not variance of the X size. So a little different than what I wrote over here. So that'll help you to kind of distinguish and pull those things apart. Uh, and you're going to evaluate everything, all your p's at p hat, but p hat is x bar again. And here I plugged in x bar already for you. So I could have plugged in p hat there. So again, I'm mincing the notation just so you can get used to people subtly changing notations on you and it doesn't freak you out. Because that's what's going to happen as you move outside the classroom. Okay, problem two. Uh, oh, this is the delta method one. Problem two, you're going to do maybe the bootstrap where you take the bootstrap averages to compute the average. And you can do something similar with uh, the variance. And you can compute the empirical variances from bootstrap. Keep in mind, if, N is, if P is small, or let's say P is big, close to one or something like that, and N is small, when you bootstrap replicate everything, you might get a vector of all one. And things are going to go horribly wrong when you do that. And so uh, you will have to count also how many times the method fails and things like that. So is it a total failure? Can you get anything out of that? What do you want to say about it? But when methods fail even once on me, I kind of think all bets are off. But you'll just study this and uh, look over different sample sizes and different configurations of keys. So you'll study for keys in that range. So we're just chopping the, the interval up into 10 points. Is this 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7 points. OK, so I'm going to um, make your life a little bit easier. So a partition of 7 points of the interval 0 to 1. And you'll look at four different configurations of n. So you're going to have 28 different configurations that you're going to be studying. If you can, make some plots and stuff like that instead of huge tables, that would be nice. And it would be nice if you didn't have 28 different plots. It's nice when you can plot things on the same plot. If you want some help on thinking about what should I plot, you can ask me those questions. Otherwise, I'm going to leave, leave it open-ended. Saying that, I kind of like side-by-side -side box plots for this kind of stuff. You know, We can talk about that later. But I'm going to leave some of this as open-ended. You get to report back what you think is interesting. Um, so you'll do bootstrap, you'll do delta, and then you'll do phase. And this just basically says <coughs> that. So you're going to be operating off of a beta prime distribution. If you want to look up on Wiki what a beta prime is, that could help you. You could do Monte Carlo estimates of everything doing phase. That will slow down your code a ton. So if you wanted to like empirically um, compute the mean from a beta prime, you might sample out of this distribution 10 million times and compute the empirical average. That would be the Bayesian mean, so the posterior mean. Or you could look up on Wiki, is there a closed form solution to that mean? And just plug that thing in. And it turns out there is a closed form solution to that mean. 
there's a closed form solution to the, the variance as well. I will point out, if you use the beta half-half prior, the variance in the mean might not always exist. So that leaves you hanging. What should I do if I'm going to make comparisons? Keep in mind the Bayesian posterior is going to exist regardless. So maybe you don't want to report the mean and the variance. That's what I would probably suggest. So um, I think I, I wrote a couple comments in here, comments, potential pitfalls, things that you would maybe think about. And then I have for like a Bayesian analysis, I put in this comment, what would Scotland do? And so I would compute not the mean and the variance. <laughs> you know, saying that, what you could do is maybe you could take your hyperparameters and make them bigger and bias the answers a little bit and induce the mean and the variance. I'm not going to mark you off on making choices as long as you say what the relative pitfall is to doing that. So there's things you could do to uh, make your life easier and save some time and just say what I would probably do in practice is this, what I wanted to do in apples to apples comparison and show what could maybe go wrong. I think that that's valuable as well. So usually I see simulation studies and examples in colloquiums where everything goes right and I really want to see where does this go wrong? Please tell me. You know, I wish people wrote those papers or said that, but it's just I don't know. It's not a human thing to admit to admit it. <laughs> you know? Anyway, um, I'd like you to be honest, have fun with it. You'll have ample time to do that. That's due in about a month. But get started over the break on it. You know, it's like build your simulator stuff. <laughs> So at least like compute all the data and store it for all the configurations. What I'd like you to do for the three different simulation studies, three different methods, each with um, four configurations of N, seven configurations of P, 28 configurations, is use the same data in all of them. Otherwise, you're not exactly apples to apples. So, if you didn't do that and you repeated the data generation for each method, I won't be able to tell. On average, you'll be telling me what happens, but it won't be exactly a paired analysis. So if you forget to do that, I can't tell. It's not a big deal, but it would be more, um, more reasonable if you, if you were storing all that data somewhere. So that's at least the first thing you can do is just build the data generation. Cool. And don't cheat. Don't be like, oh shoot, this one has all the ones in it, you know, or something like that. I'm not using that. Let's toss it, you know. So again, this is repeated stuff. So you want to you want to account for that. If you say never fail, I don't know. <laughs> I will not believe you. So okay, okay, cool. I also put some problems uh, up that you can start practicing. There aren't too many here. They're just problems to help you get through sufficiency. So if you want to study a few problems that I might be asking about on Wednesday exam, I'll probably ask something about sufficiency. So a few problems there. That's due on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. So that will be um, after we come back from spring. Okay, so just a reminder also, um, after our exam on Wednesday, I will gift you Friday and no class on Friday. Everything for logistics. Let's see how far we can get on sufficiency. Today I'd like to talk about the factorization theorem. It says, we can just keep this in, mind, in our mind, that I'm imagining that's maybe some PDF or some mass function. It doesn't matter which one it is. This is true for both things. Um, but if t of x is sufficient, then f of x factorizes into the sufficient statistic, and it depends on theta. So there's a relationship between the sufficient statistic and theta. And then there'll be another function that factorizes out that just depends on the data and doesn't have any, de any dependency on theta itself. So, and that's an if and only if statement. So if t of x is sufficient, the factorization exists. If um, the factorization exists, then whatever made the fact, whatever is the part that's next to theta is a sufficient statistic. So we'll prove that. Uh, I want to just 
recap what we said last time. So this is the proof in the way that they write it in the book. So this is kind of the way they wrote everything in the book that they said, let's let experimenter one have random variable x, so that's experimenter one's distribution. They get to observe x and they can compute t of x. And so they've got some sampling distribution. Both experimenters get to know what the model is. So they know what the model is. And the only difference is experimenter one gets to see all the, the actual data points. The end data point, experimenter two only gets to see the sufficient statistic. Experimenter one can compute the sufficient statistic from their data points. So they get both pieces of information. So experimenter one's distribution can be expanded like this. If I've got x, this doesn't introduce any more stochasticity. This is just a deterministic transformation, and I can just throw it in there. So the joint distribution of these two things is governed by the um, stochasticity of the original x's. That's true for all transforms. Um, I can factorize this. If I cut the theta in, it wouldn't actually require anything about t of x. I wouldn't need to know that t of x is sufficient, but because I know t of x is sufficient, the theta cancels out. So this conditional distribution does not depend on theta. And you want to think about that conditional distribution is the original sampling density divided by the distribution on the sufficient statistic. So that's what that distribution is. Um, so you can write that down. It's got the x in there. We'll, we'll imagine there's another line in here where we substitute that x for a y. But this is true. So exact same statement that we have up here. And then the book makes an, an exchange. And it says, experimenter two, we can spot in their random variable right there. And they could have sampled x. So it's a hypothetical statement. So what it's saying is that experimenter two knows how to sample from this distribution. So if they got the original model, they can work out that distribution and presumably they can sample from it. We'll look at another example in a moment. Last time when we were talking about the binomial example or the Bernoulli, however you want to think about it, um, that distribution was just a uniform distribution over the ones and zeros with a fixed number of ones in it. That's what that distribution is. And so what I have written down is something slightly different that I didn't just write down x, but I wrote down that this could have been a y, some other thing. And this would have the constraint that t y is t x, i.e. experimenter 2 is going to sample some vector of ones and zeros from its corresponding distribution is uniform. So you just imagine a hat with an array of ones and zeros in the hat in different orders, but they all have the same fixed number of ones. So they're just going to draw from that hat after shuffling it thoroughly. Um, it doesn't matter that experimenter 2 samples exactly the same vector that experimenter 1 saw. It really only matters that they sample a vector with that same number of fixed ones. So the book writes x in here. They have a comment in the early paragraph that maybe tries to help you think about that. Uh, but you could put in a y right there and just tell us that the t of y is equal to t of x. They're the same statistics, same sums in terms of the binomial example. Um, so the book just comes down and it says, well, this whole thing right here, if we just interchange and you can accept that I can interchange y, the experiment of two's random variable in there, then I can just recombine this, upgrade that to a random variable again, but that's no extra information, just like this step. So we were able to insert it, so we can just get rid of it too. And so what I would have to remind us of is that could also be ty if I said that was y. So if I like that argument. I think that's slightly more general. So I like it that way. If you like the way the book likes to think about it and think that experimenter 2 took exactly experimenter 1's vector, that's fine. But they didn't actually need that particular vector. 
So recombine everything, and then we have this new distribution right here. And so what we've just said is experimental one's distribution is experimental two's distribution. So even if this was equal to a y, and that y had the property that t of x is equal to t of y, this distribution would have exactly the same information about the parameter is experimental one's distribution. So it's just like looking at the Bernoulli likelihood versus the binomial likelihood, i.e. they have the same info. Let's look at one more example. And I want to just kind of discuss how experimenter two might sample from that distribution. The uniform is pretty easy to think about. This is in the book, but there's probably a little bit more to say about this example than what they write in the book. I'm going to say we've got NIID samples from a normal distribution, it's a pretty standard example, and I'm going to think about sigma is fixed. For right now, we get to know it. It's not part of our inferential problem, so I'm going to say we want to learn mu. Um, just real quickly, what's the sufficient statistic for mu? X bar. So you gave me the minimal sufficient statistic, so that's a good one. Some of the XIs is also it. So X bar is one of them. That's actually a nice unbiased version of it. So that might be how we actually use it. Um, and also, all of the data is sufficient as well. So, but I like the answer. It's X bar. How do you know that? You apply the factorization theorem in your head, right? When we're doing that, some likelihood it just works out to be. Yeah. So you might have an argument that I know I can use x bar. It's the MLE. It seems to work every single time, and I can't see of any way to make x bar any smaller than it is. It's already one dimensional, so how do you have a 0.5 dimensional statistic? You don't. <laughs> you know, it's got to be an integer number of things. You've got to hold it. So, so maybe a little bit of intuition. It's, it's obviously x bar. Let's demonstrate that. So here's how you might demo it. So you might first work out the distribution of the original data points. I'm just going to say this is conditional on mu. It hurts me not to plug the sigma squared in there, but I'm just going to leave it out because we're not thinking about sigma squared. So I'm just going to write this down. Um, this is equal to product, i goes from 1 to n, 1 over square root 2 pi, sigma, that's the way I normally write it. Might change my mind in a second. So that's the joint sampling distribution, it's just the product of the distribution for the, the individual elements. I'll rewrite this as 2 pi sigma squared to the minus n over 2. So now I've tucked my sigma squared under the square root sign. So e to the minus, I'll say 1 half sum, i goes from 1 to n, xi minus mu squared divided by sigma squared. So same exact thing. I'm going to introduce x bar because I know that this problem has something to do with x bar. Real quickly, if you've got something that's quadratic and I was trying to figure out where this was centered and I took a derivative over that function, set it equal to zero and solved for where it was centered, it'd be x bar. So if you wanted to check why are we plugging this in? Because we're plugging in the center and we know that the answer has something to do with that. So every time you see a quadratic, you're thinking plug in an x bar. So that's the answer to whoever's question is like, how do you know how to plug in x bar? And the answer is we did it once, it seemed to do good things. So we continue to do that and that's always true if you're working with a quadratic. So I can expand everything, Let's just rewrite this. Two pi sigma squared, minus n over 2, e to the minus 1 half, sum, i goes from 1 to n, 
and I'm just going to write this out. Xi minus X bar squared. Put it all inside of here. So this is going to be minus 2xi minus x bar, x bar minus mu, plus x bar minus mu squared. So I've just expanded the square is all. There's a square. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Sigma squared there, my square is there. Okay. Cool. Yes. In the second force. Yeah, would you have to add and subtract an x bar rather than like subtracting the x bar? Oh. Yeah. This is you are absolutely right. So subtract an x bar. Oh my goodness, really? X bar minus mu. So let's just plug in minus x bar, and you're saying just plus this x bar in there. That's how we want that. So this is like that, like that. So this is plus, that's x bar. Awesome. <laughs> I would have gotten the right thing amazingly. <laughs> so thank you for making the steps correct. Um, sum across all of this. So we all notice that when we drag the sum over this, this factorizes outside of the sums, and we know sum of the xi's minus x bar itself. That's always equal to zero. So the cross term cancels. So that's going to go to zero, and this whole thing is just 2 pi sigma squared minus n over 2, e to the minus 1 half, and there's two pieces in here, and I'm just going to factorize it out. So I'm going to have sum of the xi minus x bar squared. Oh, and I also forgot my sigma squared in all of this. We're still dividing by sigma squared. Divided by sigma squared there, i goes from 1 to n, times e to the minus 1 half when I drag the sum across this, there's no index on anything in here, so I'm summing something up that's the same n times. So this is going to be n times x bar minus mu squared over sigma squared. It's just another way to write down that distribution. Let's look at what the distribution for x bar is. I think we can just write that down in one step. I'll just say recall. X bar is normally distributed. It has a mean mu. It has variance sigma squared over n drive all of that in about 30 seconds. So that means f of x bar given mu is equal to 1 over root 2 pi square root of that. There's the sigma over root n right there. e to the minus 1 half x bar minus mu squared sigma squared over n. We can rewrite this as 2 pi sigma squared over n minus 1 half e to the minus x bar minus mu squared sigma squared by n. The key point to this is this thing is this. I put the n's in slightly different places. But they're exactly the same functions. So f of x given mu, and this is the same thing as f of x x bar 
no extra information, and mute. So we'll get used to not writing that after a while. You don't have to put that part in. That is the same distribution. So divided by f of x bar, mu. I'm just going to do the cancellation in our head, but if you want to write it in explicitly, you can write down that function. But this part will cancel that part. And then I'll write everything else out. So this is going to be the ratio of these normalizing constants. Sigma squared over n to the minus 1 half over 2 pi sigma squared to the minus n over 2 times e to the minus 1 half sum of the x i's minus x bar squared over sigma squared. i goes from 1 to n. So that's just this part that's still left. So that didn't get canceled out in the ratio. So that function got canceled out in the ratio. Are the normalized constants the other way? This one, oh yeah, I did this the wrong way. All the stuff that doesn't matter, I always get right. <laughs> I always get wrong because I know that I usually throw it away. So sorry for my practice behavior. Uh, the normalizing constant almost never matters. <laughs> Anything. When you're working in ratios and stuff, it usually doesn't matter. So you can usually just toss it and factorize it out. It would be part of that hx function, the part that doesn't factorize. So what we noticed, I've been saying this, everything just factorized out, and we noticed that this function here is something that factorized out and it canceled. That's guaranteed to happen if this is not going to be a function of mu. So not a function of mu. So x bar is sufficient. So this gives you a way to verify if a statistic is sufficient. So if I asked you to explicitly verify that a test statistic was sufficient, you would work through that and do something like that. Let me just ask a quick question. Um, what do you think is sufficient for sigma squared? We've asked this question before. Summation of the Yeah, it's this bit. This part tells you it. So this part we factorized out of the equation, and what we notice is we can never disentangle this part from the sigma squared. We can never pull them apart from each other. So this part of the data you can never pull apart from the parameter, so it's always going to factorize with the parameter. That means that it's sufficient. That is how I apply the factorization theorem in my head. I just look at the formula and I see what part of the data will always be stuck next to the parameter. And if I can never factorize it away, that must be part of the sufficient statistic. Does that make sense? So if we were to do the same game on sigma squared, of course we couldn't have written down this distribution because we've lost information in sigma squared by writing this down this way. So we just used x bar for everything. If we had written everything down this way and we worked explicitly through this distribution, we'd have that chunk that appears in the distribution for some of the xi's minus x bar, all of that. Saying that, it's a little bit hard to like think about in advance and anticipate these things are your sufficient statistics, and so that's why we have this theorem, the factorization theorem, to make this a little bit more clear. But I think if you understand this argument, that this ratio not being a function of something means something is factorized out and it's canceled out. So the factorization theorem has to exist. That's going to be true. Let's prove it. <coughs> we'll just write a note. Note. Sum of the xi's minus x bar squared is sufficient for sigma squared. And you can verify that. 
So instead of working through and figuring out what the distribution of this creature is explicitly, which would be a lot more math, um, you could apply the factorization theorem directly. Does anybody know what distribution that follows? Yeah, so chi-squared distribution. So you can work out which chi-squared distribution that is. So factorization theorem is nice enough to make it so that you don't have to do that stuff. So again, the practical way to use the factorization theorem is kind of just work through some algebra or imagine the algebra and see what you cannot factorize away from the parameter in the distribution. So you'll never factorize x bar away from mu. It'll always be stuck next to it. So if I expand that term, mu minus x bar squared, I'm always going to have the cross term where mu and x bar are stuck next to each other. You can never factorize them apart from each other. Okay. So let's do this. Proof. So what this says is f of x can be factorized into some function of the sufficient statistic in the parameter and some function that just deals with the data. These functions don't need to be distributions. Very typically, you could normalize them and turn them into distributions. So they're just some arbitrary functions. This is an if and only if statement, so it goes in both directions. So if t of x is sufficient, this factorization will exist. And if t of x is sufficient, uh, if the factorization exists, then t of x is sufficient. So let's do a proof. So first, let's go the other direction, the, the easy direction. Let's say t of x is sufficient. This has got to be the easiest proof in the book, at least this direction of it. So, f of x, given theta, I can rewrite like this, f of x and t of x, given theta. That didn't even need to be sufficient for me to do that. It's just any deterministic transform of the data, all of the randomness is controlled by the original data. So I can factorize this f of x given t of x in theta, f of t of x given theta. That's true regardless of if t of x is sufficient. Here's where we use the sufficiency of everything. We know this function right here doesn't depend on theta because t of x is sufficient. My intuitive understanding is the ratio that I need to form that distribution have the exact same shapes. So, same information. So not a function of theta. So t of x is sufficient. So we can get rid of that. So this is f of x given t of x f of t of x given theta. I will point out just real quickly, we'll use this in the other direction, that f and that f are not the same functions. So there's something different. I'm just kind of abusing the notation again. So if you wanted to make them different functions, you could distinguish that to yourself. This is the distribution over the x's, conditioned on the sufficient statistic. This is the distribution of t of x given theta. So these are explicitly distributions. So, but we could call this h of x. That's a function of just the data. And this right here is a function of the sufficient statistic conditional on theta. So it shows the relationship between the sufficient statistic and the parameter. So the factorization exists. And this proof gives you an explicit factorization that will always exist if t of x is sufficient. So we're just recycling that bit of information that we had from our earlier proof. 
Ready for the other direction? Let's do it. This proof is simple if you understand how transformation of variables work. So we probably need a five minute inserted conversation about what the heck are they talking about. So I'll give you an example that tries to express what they're talking about. But we're gonna say the factorization exists and then we're gonna prove T of X is sufficient. So factorization exists. And then we'll prove, so F of X can be written like this. G T of X given theta H of X. And that will prove that T of X is sufficient. So we'll use that piece of information. So let's just write down this ratio. F of X given theta and I want to divide it by the distribution for g t of x, or the distribution for t of x given theta. So I want this distribution for t of x given theta. Now I'm going to be a little bit more polite here and not call that f. I'm going to say it is t of x's distribution, and I'm going to distinguish that from x's distribution. They're different things. So usually I've been writing an f down there and just making sure you realize the arguments are defining the distribution, but let's be slightly more polite. So these distributions, these functions are inherently different, so let's add that to our notation. Different functions. So this is one of the three times in the class that I'll be polite and distinguish what well, that they are different functions. So I can rewrite this is G T of X given the data H of X that's in the numerator. So I've just applied this part right here. The factorization exists, so I'll just plug in the factorization. They make a quick step in the book. I need to explain this. So let me give you some notation real quick. So T of X is equal to T of Y. They would use more bizarre notation that they give the name to the set and then they define the set in a paragraph. So I'll just do it all at once. This is going to be F of Y given theta. This is always true. This is a transform right here. And I might even say it's a definition, and I think that the book says that's the definition of a transformation of random variables. So we have to think about what it actually means. This is probably the way that you first learn transformations when you're in a STAT 101 type class, and you're working in discrete sets or something like that. They probably explicitly had you do this by hand. So what this says is this the set of Ys. So these are going to be the set of data points. This is just data points. Such that this condition is true. So that's how you read these things. So this says, what is the set of? The curly braces tell me it's a set. This is the set of something. They're the set of some vectors of data points such that some condition is true. So this is a constraint on everything. And that's how you, you read that. So what this says is this is all the different ways I can formulate data sets that have the sufficient statistic, T of X, or whatever this function is. We'll prove it's sufficient in a second. It is a sufficient statistic. But that function is constrained so that it's the original function T of X. Let me give you an example. And then you sum over all those things. So this is the original distribution. So that's the disk of 
data points. The original distribution is that F. So this F and that F are the same Fs. Let me give you an example. Imagine you were going to roll some dice. Okay, so I've got some original data points. I'm going to have two different dice. I'm going to have X1, and it can land on one, two, three, four, five, or six. And I'm going to have an X2, and it can land on one, two, three, four, five, six. And each one of these is going to have corresponding probability one six. So that can happen with probability one six. That can happen with probability one six, one six, one six, one six. There's another one six in there. And these can all happen with probability one six. So they're IID replicates of the same thing. So you're imagining a six sided dice, it's fair. So I'm going to consider a transformation of random variables. So my transformation is going to be y is going to be equal to x1 plus x2. Okay, so piece of cake. And I'm going to ask the question, what's the probability that y is equal to a 7? And I want to figure out what that probability is. So I might be asking a question like that. What's the probability of some transformation given the original parameters in the model? The original parameters in the model are the 1, 6. So thetas are the 1, 6 in this problem. So how do I do this? I enumerate all the different ways that I can form a set. So I can have a 1 and a 6. I can have a 6 and a 1. I can have a 2 and a 5, I can have a 5 and a 2, I can have a 3 and a 4, a 4 and a 3. Any other ways to do this? No. So those are six different ways that I can do this. I can compute the original probability from the original space. So I'm going to get the probabilities for each one of these. This is going to have handle the probability of 1, 6 times 1 6, which is 36, right there. So how did I get that? I looked to the original distribution, and I used its, their, its probabilities to compute the probabilities of the random variable. And then I counted up and I added six times. So I'm ultimately going to get the answer that this is going to be six times 1 over 36. So this is probability 1 6. So that's the number of ways you can do it. That's what this says right here. So if I'm going to transform a random variable, I can look at the probabilities of the original space from the F, and I can compute this probability of the transform by summing up all the different possibilities over things. So I had an inherent constraint built in here that I was asking the question that y was equal to 7. So that's what I'm summing up and constraining everything by. And then I compute the probabilities from the original model. So that's what happens here. So hopefully you understand that. That's just step 101 with some buttered up notation. So that's what the book says very quickly is the definition of a transformation. I didn't know that was the definition, but that's certainly the way I first saw it when I was working with like a contingency table and some things. Probably doing this exact same example. So now we can finish the proof. Numerator is exactly the same. Sum, I've got this constraint that's important. And instead of writing down that, I'll reapply that we know that, that factorization exists on the original distribution. So this is G, T, Y, given theta, H, Y. So same exact thing. Keep in mind, I know what that function is. It's always got the exact same constraint. 
train in there. The TYs are enforced to be the TXs. So I'm working through that constraint. I'm only summing things up with that constraint. So this part of the function is always the same because it only depends on t of x and or t of y and t of y is always constrained to be t of x. So this is a constant and I can factorize that outside. So let's just do that. So this is g t of x given theta h of x. When I factorize this outside, they're not any old ty's, they're ones that ty's are equal to t of x. So when I factorize it outside, these are all evaluated in t of x given theta. And then I have this sum over this set, same set. t of y's are equal to the t of x's. And this is hy right here. These two things cancel each other. That's what factorizes. So no dependency on theta, not a function of theta. And that's the punchline, so it's not sufficient. I'll just point out, what is that thing? What are you left with? That's the ratio of normalizing constants. That's all that's happening there. So for every example, this will be your ratio of normalizing constants, and it doesn't have the parameters in there. They don't have any info for us. So that's what happened here. These are the ratios of normalizers for that problem. Keep in mind, sigma squared was fixed. So this is all constant. For our earlier example with the Bernoulli versus the binomial, we got the one over the number of combinations and choose some of the xi's. That was the ratio of the normalizing constants. So that's all you're looking at. Um, I think next time, we'll come in, look at the, extra, the not extra credit. The assignment is the assignment. Um, I will say a few things. Um, I think what I would like you to do for what we can maybe do next time, and I guess we'll go. Okay, more comments on Monday. Have a great weekend, you guys. So.